All right, a little back wind up here, so it gets it out of the microphone. I use an umbrella more for wind than I do rain. Sounding the alarm at Starkey Road Baptist Church. Is there a church I can go to that just in a few stays, if you go there, you find out they're so far off the gospel? But I found it off. Attended Sunday school several times. Quite impressed with the knowledge of the members. Sooner or later, it gets around to the basics. Third time. Pastor Lancaster preached that day, Acts 20 and 29. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come among you, not, not sparing the flag of the flock. And he provided a number of references from elsewhere in Scripture to support this point of view, that you have to follow the wolves in sheep's clothing, and they'll be in there and they'll sound good, but they're not true believers. So, Continuously unfaithful believing behavior indicates that one was not saved. They're wolves disguised as sheep. Sooner or later, the fangs come out or something. I don't know. His citations and conclusions, however, did damage to the context of each passage. He cited, For no believer can declare, be declared totally free of bad fruit at any time in his mortal life. So to examine one's personal walk to see if one is truly saved can never really give you true insurance because we're never really that uh, faithful all the time. The only place that assurance can be real is to focus on Christ and Him alone. So go to 1 John chapter 5, 9 through 13. Verse 13 says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. It should be may know, not many. So you can read the rest of that passage. <clears throat> Pastor Lancaster then cited John 10, 27. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. So you have to follow the voice of Christ in order to be a true believer. Never once departing, really. He stipulated this uh, taught that a true believer will most assuredly follow Christ in faithful behavior, doing damage to the context of John chapter 10. This puts all believers on an unattainable pedestal, securing their salvation by personal Consistent, unwavering faithfulness from the beginning. Now if you go back up, let's take a look back up. You do not believe because you're not my sheep. Verse 26. So you are the sheep of Christ, whether you follow him in, in deeds or not. When you believe. So he goes to 1027 and says, My sheep hear my voice, I know them and they follow me. But Ephesians 2 8 9 says, By grace you have been saved through faith. This salvation is not of yourselves, the gift of God, not by works. 2 9, ruling out obedience and lifestyle, and no one can be boast. So an obedient lifestyle is required. It's not here in this passage. And you go on and on and on about that. But let's go back to the testimony of this church and the pastor. So I took the opportunity, as is my want, knowing by experience that windows of opportunity are fleeting. So when they open, dive right in and share your faith because it'll slam, be sh slam shut pretty quickly, as I usually find out. It definitely wasn't in this case. To speak to him, about the fact that the Bible teaches that any kind of behavior or proof to be saved is not required and not trustworthy anyway. And faithfulness after conversion is not guaranteed, albeit commanded. At first he totally agreed, but then he took it all back and demanded that once one became a true believer. So I'm, can I be an untrue believer? There had to be a change in one's behavior. Otherwise, one's salvation was in question. I reiterated the previous point to which he agreed that salvation was by faith alone unattached to any requirement to be faithful. I also stipulated that 2 Cor 5.17, which he cited, referred not to an experiential view of faithful behavior as a new creation, but a positional view as a new creation in Christ for those who are truly saved, those who believe. I emphasize that, how do you get untruly saved? I emphasize that this passage is not attached to any guarantees that the new believer will be faithful. See, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. 
new things have come. Well, if you're new in Christ at the moment of faith, but you're not, you're a work in progress. You're not a perfect believer at any by any stake throughout this whole mortal life. You're neither Jew nor Gentile. You're part of the body of Christ. Anyway, you can look at that. As a matter of fact, I mentioned that there were passages in Scripture which supported the possibility that believers may not be faithful, despite of the fact that they are exhorted to be obedient. I reiterated that the change in an individual conversion was positional with the capacity to demonstrate faithfulness, but there are no guarantees stipulated that all true believers will be faithful. That's why we have the letters to admonish believers to, to be on the straight and narrow path, studying them, walking toward the light and walking in the light, and being faithful as one grows as a Christian. Pastor Lancaster took offense at this, however, as I supported my point of view from Scripture. 1 Corinthians 3, 11-15, talk about the judgment seat and eternal security. Let me get to 11-15. This is the judgment seat of Christ. If any man builds on this foundation in twelve, using gold, silver, and scalcy stones, and wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is. This is believers. These are believers there in view, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, not the believer himself, he will suffer loss. He suffers the loss if you're not faithful. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through flames. So your faithfulness has to do with resulting in rewards or not, not whether or not you get your salvation, which is a gift. In Romans chapter 6, verse all of them, 1 to the end. Again, you can study this and talk about your position in Christ because of your faith. Well, the pastor suggested that I was not compatible with the congregation and hence not welcomed anymore at Stocky Road Baptist Church to attend. Several deacons interrupted our conversation and requested I meet with them in the church hallway. The deacons then accused me of a number of unsupported things from hearsay. One of them bitterly declared that they were watching me in a tone that implied some kind of habitual evil on my part. They continued their accusations, which were so general as to be questionable. As I questioned them, they said that they refused to enter into any debate with me, trying to insult me by accusing me of the evil, of being a master debater. Wow. I recall that our Lord was a master debater defending the doctrines of the faith, which are indeed commanded of every believer to do in season and out. Let's take a look at this. We did a study in defending the faith. Jude 1, 3. Look at this. Dear friends, fellow believers, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend, that means argue, for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. Contend means argue. Look at that later. Okay, so this group of deacons escorted me, kind of in captivity, off the church grounds all the way to the sidewalk, taking great offense toward me from what someone else said about me, hearsay evidence. Some of it was untrue, and the rest was not substantiated nor made clear to me by them by virtue of their refusal to get into any discussions with me. So... I don't have the right to hear what I'm accused of, just tried and found guilty. Apparently, they were operating upon hearsay and unwilling to give me a fair hearing. Ironically, they were debating with me about not debating. So you can't argue. If, if you don't agree with arguing with somebody, you can't argue about that. Note that none of my website posts were untrue in the information I provided. Certain congregations preaching a false gospel and their mistreatment of me. Nevertheless, they said I violated their unbiblical doctrine by defending, arguing the doctrines of the faith, causing divisions in the body of Christ. Interesting to note that our Lord literally said, He did not come to bring peace, but division. And this he did by defending, arguing the doctrines of the faith, especially the gospel. Take a look at this. Defending the faith. A Christian is required to make an active and fearless defense of truths from God's word to unbelievers and believers alike, so every believer has his duty. It's supported in Scripture by Jude 1.3, by the dictionary. 
and other passages. Evidently, these deacons were not familiar with the doctrine of the freedom of the believer in Christ to defend the doctrines of the faith in season and out. They continually threw their main perceived insult at me by calling me a master debater. Well, that's an insult, really. Whatever that means, doctrinally and grace-oriented congregations are few and far between. Might I suggest one in Fort Worth, Texas? Well, 522-2005, Grace Community Church says goodbye and so on. Sometimes I have a flood of congregations I go to. I met a man named Billy Little passing out tracts at Baywalk, St. Petersburg, Florida, nearby where I lived a number of months ago. Our conversation was not very amicable at first. I questioned the multi-steps in his tract, which stipulated as necessary to receive eternal life. On the other hand, several of the passages which were quoted in the tract stipulated a moment of faith alone in Christ alone unto eternal life, contradicting what the track overall concluded. He met my questions with illogical points and a personal attack. My responses from Scripture served to fuel the fire of his anger. Nevertheless, I persisted with him, and the conversation finally ended on a friendly note with an invitation to Grace Community Church from him and a declaration by Billy, who announced himself as the pastor, that we were in effect saying the same thing in different ways. He would take this conclusion back later on. So I began attending Grace Community Church several weeks later. Sunday school quickly became a welcome place for me to fellowship and participate. No one objected to my point of view on the gospel or other matters when I expressed it in the participatory lesson format. I did this frequently in the class and in the congregation, even passing out small printouts of my personal testimony, which you can get here. Here's a tract. You can open this up, print it out in Microsoft Word, and other key Bible studies. Over the months that I attended, there were uh, no objections about made of, or words of censure spoken to me by anyone at Grace for anything that I did. As a matter of fact, no one in the class voiced an agreement with Pastor Billy's version of the gospel, which included repentant behavior. All in the church that I communicated with apparently held to the same gospel that I found in the Bible and shared with others. A moment of faith alone in Christ alone plus nothing else, and one received eternal life. I presented my personal testimony track to Pastor Billy and other studies so as to be up front as to what I was communicating to people that I met at Grace Community. He offered no correction or comment. He avoided all conversations that were about the Bible except to say that we were saying the same thing in different ways. Last Sunday, May 26, I attended the church potluck dinner after the morning service and engaged several people in the conversation. One young man said that he believed that reincarnation was in the Bible. I carefully refuted that idea, explaining the difference between being resurrected from the dead and the false idea of reincarnation, the latter being a doctrine wherein one may come back as an animal or have another totally different person in the past or have been. This, I explain, is refuted in Scripture, especially in the verse in Hebrews, which I quoted. And just as it is appointed for all men once to die, and after that certain judgment, it means you got one life to live. While the conversation was going on, Pastor Billy's wife came to sit right across from me and angrily inter interpreted, interrupted our conversation, telling the young man that the Bible does not teach reincarnation. Her anger seemed to be mainly focused on me as if I might be saying something objectionable. When I affirmed what she said, she became very agitated, jumped out and walked, jumped up and walked out quickly out of the room. Later on that afternoon, Pastor Billy called me at home and told me to move on. He accused me of teaching reincarnation, proselytizing people at the church, handing out undesirable tracts, teaching a gospel different from the one he preaches, among other things. He changed his position on the, on the two of us, saying the same thing but in a different way, that the gospel even at our initial meeting at Baywalk. I told him I aggressively refuted reincarnation many times. I also asked him unanswered questions. How the gospel of John does not have the word repent in it yet. Yet Billy, Pastor, Pastor Billy insists one must to repent of one's sins in order to be saved. I also asked him if he was going to expel everyone in my Sunday class uh, too because they all held to the same gospel I did. He implied that